back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. You ever come across a listing that just makes you scratch your head in amazement? That is exactly what happened to me on this Gibson Les Paul Tribute Bass. Okay, so it's listed at 1100 bucks, which is well more than it sold for brand new. So w what has gone on here? We got one pickup, two pickup, bridge tailpiece, huh? What? To understand this one, we need to go back in time just a little bit. So in 2019, Gibson had a guitar that looked like this. It was just a single P90 in the bridge. It was a wrap tailpiece, master volume, master tone with the output jack on the front. However, midway through the year, they changed these things up and they had a side output jack and they introduced the special, which looked like this guy right here. You can check out my full reviews and demos of those guitars if you wish. They were pretty darn good for the price point. I think if I remember correctly, it was like $7.99 and $9.99. But towards the end of their very short lifespan, they were blown out rather cheaply. We're talking anywhere around $550 for the juniors. I think like $7.99 on the specials if I remember correctly. But at the same time that the special was introduced, they also did a bass. Now, I was not the biggest fan of this bass. I thought it was, you know, good enough for the price point. But somebody took this and converted it into a guitar. <laughs> I love it because it's technically a baritone guitar. And if you read in their description, it is a massive 30 and a half inch scale length. So I guess technically this is more of like a bass six, but he's got it strung up with regular, just heavy gauge guitar strings on here, not the bass six gauge. So normally baritones in Gibson land, they're 27 inches like the Buckethead Les Paul. Sometimes you'll get the 28 inches like, like what they did with the studio baritones, but 30 and a half inches. I don't think Gibson has ever experimented with a bass six in recent history. Now they did the ones I think back in the late 50s, early 60s, but those are pretty rare. Most people don't even know about them. So modern day, somebody converted it and I, I love it. I'm completely on board with this. So let's see what they did. So instead of having that pick up towards the middle, it looks like they just completely did a new homemade custom pick guard on here and moved the humbucker up just a little bit. And then they routed it out for another humbucker in the bridge. So you still have a two pickup set up here. It's quite the bold move right there. But you can't see the original tailpiece studs. I'm surprised they didn't fill those in or try to do something else with them but then they had to install a regular bridge and tailpiece setup. Now, I'm not an expert on how to build guitars, but I'm sure they had to keep the 30 and a half inch scale length because the fret spacing is already set for that or something. Otherwise, I guess you could have just converted it into a guitar, but I mean, where's the fun in that? So let's read up on what pickups they threw in here. Looks like we got some pretty decent stuff. Seymour Duncan 59 humbuckers, AKA the SH-1N and the SH-1B. So it looks like roughly $150 worth of parts right there. They're not high-end boutique pickups by any means, but they also had to install a three-way toggle switch and they left it with a master volume, master tone. Interesting choice. The problem with buying mod jobs like these online though, is you never know if it was a quality conversion. Was this an amateur guitar modder that really didn't know what he was doing? And is the intonation spot on? Was the bridge put in the right place? Are the pickups even in the right place? Those are some serious questions. And without being able to try before you buy, it's always a little bit scary. So I can't comment on that about this particular guitar, but check this out. Oh, it's, it's just so freaky, I love it. So we've got Grover tuners on here. Originally, it would have had these style of tuners. So how, how did they manage that without showing the imprints? They must have used the same screw hole locations here. Okay, yeah, that surprisingly does look like it would line up. Assuming that there is no larger imprint left up here. I'm surprised that worked out for them. And then they just had to drill the headstock for these additional tuners. That way you could turn it into a six string. As far as the back, they didn't do any additional modifications here. So I've just got to hand it to this guy for doing it. It's strange, but it looks like it would actually be kind of fun because it's already a guitar shape as well. So it's not that off-putting and I would have never thought to do this by myself. Unfortunately, I do not have a playing demo of this particular mod job. 
but we can check out my demo of this bass. So his price at $1,100. I mean, if you wanted to pay somebody to modify your guitar for you, that's probably around what it would end up costing you. So this is one of those situations where I'm not surprised that it sold for somewhere around that range. I mean, somebody made an offer, even though most people would be like, oh, you ruined it. But at this point in time, these are pretty much a dime a dozen. They're very plentiful on the market. Some shops still have these brand new for $9.99. You can get a used one for $800. It'd probably cost you at least $1,000 if you bought a used one to convert one to that. And the only reason why I'm pricing it like this is because it really has been transformed into something all on its own. You can no longer compare it to the DC bases. So good job, BJC Custom Guitars. You guys created a beautiful monstrosity. But since we got a little bit of time left today, let's check out some things that were just listed. This is, wow, for a 2003, that is in fantastic shape. He bought it brand new when he worked at his local Gibson dealership, which means he probably got a nice little discount on it. And he never played it. Why not? That's an awesome V. But I get it, a collector's standpoint. That's blinding. You know, 2003, isn't that one of the first years that they offered the Flying V Custom? This might actually be a really nice investment piece for somebody. Okay, so our serial number actually tells us it was made in 2004. So maybe he ordered it in 2003 and it came with the 2004 serial number. But as far as white finishes go, yeah, that really hasn't even aged. I'm not sure why the ABR1's on upside down. Sometimes they come from the factory like that. This is looking pretty sweet. How much does he want? Was it 5,000? You know, if it was around 4,000, I would probably go ahead and take a stab at it. But I think this is just priced appropriately enough that somebody will buy this for their own collection. However, now looking at the completed listings, it looks like there's been similar ones, but most of these have the rich light fretboard. They're a bit newer, selling for around that 4,000 like I was thinking. Wow, sometimes you can get spanking deals on these Flying V Customs if you're looking. Like 3,200 bucks, that's pretty nice. However, you don't see white too often. Here's like a translucent white. You can find the bullseye over top of the white, but as far as just, you know, a pure white one, this is the only one I see. But this white pick card really makes that come to life. Normally I would have thought I would have preferred the black one. But at the same time, I like that they left the output jack, the black one, it's like an accent piece. Whereas the gold humbuckers is what steals the show there. Next up here, just a regular Les Paul special. Well, not so regular in the fact that it's kind of a, a wine red cherry color. It's got a stop bar tailpiece and a bridge. Well, this is from the era where they had the proper binding, but they had the improper bridge set up. But some people like that better because you can dial your intonation in a little bit more. But what made me want to uh, click on this, check out that wood grain. I dig it. It looks like you even have a little bit of like ribbon flame mahogany in there. Oh wow, this thing has strange specs. It's got a cutaway on the back. <laughs> you know, there were a lot of strange versions of the Les Paul Special in the Jeskowitz era. It really just depends on when this one was made. Wow, that one was 2010. That was only, what, 11 years ago? It's got a nice case. If anybody's in the market for a blueberry burst, that's actually really fair for one of those. 2300 bucks that's cheaper than a brand new one which you're kind of lucky i'm surprised they have not taken blueberry burst and ported it onto a 50s les paul standard 
because this was an insanely popular finish for a quite some time. I never got my hands on one. I can't say it's my favorite, but I can see why people dig it. The closest I've come is that uh, Goro Yuto signature last Paul. Oh, but nice. This is one of those late 2019s that had the whole dip switch that I've never got to experience, but the internet had a real heyday when those things came out. Yeah, that's not a bad price. Haggle them down a couple hundred bucks, and I think you'll be very happy. It's tempting even for myself. Oh, that's in Houston. I know Texas has been having some issues these past week or so. And we'll end today's episode off with this Dean V. Now, it's been, what, a year and a half? Two years since Play Authentic? And I'm still searching for that, you know, fairly priced vintage Dean. Like, I'm really looking for a nice flame top explorer style one. But this one, it's a cool finish. But somebody desecrated it with the Kaler. But you know, it was originally string through, which just breaks my heart even further. It just looks kind of goofy still having that bridge there. And unfortunately, any modifications to these things, it really hurts the value. There is a strong market for clean original Deans. The clean Deans is what people want. Whenever a nice one does show up, it sells within like 20 to 30 minutes. And since I'm not really on top of the market for these guys, I've let a few of them go that I probably should have picked up for the review and demo. But one day I'll find an original Dean, even though it's not popular to do so anymore. I think it's worth trying out one of these old ones. Okay, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.